Press the bell icon on YouTube and don't miss another update. It is quite evident that a very vast majority of Indians generally go with the established view on Kashmir. Established view and establishment view. And that's why there is wide support also for the abrogation of Article 370, even among our political parties, barring maybe the CPM, nobody has really opposed the abrogation. They've questioned the method. But this is a democracy. In a democracy, majority is important, but the majority is not always right. Because if majority is always right, then you have, you have a problem called majoritarianism. So those who are not in a majority and have a, and have a different view, they need to be heard also. And while you may disagree with them, you must disagree, disagree with them with your reasoning and with healthy arguments. That's what I'm trying to do today uh, in this national interest on the issue of Kashmir. I am trying to pick an argument with the very articulate, very doughty, very well-meaning and sincere liberal community. Uh, I am not mocking it. I am not mocking them. In fact, I am responding to many of the doubts and issues they have in their minds about India's Kashmir policy or India's claims in Kashmir. And I'm only countering that with facts or not countering. In fact, I'm giving it five fact checks and one reality check. Five fact checks come from archives and from documented history. One reality check comes from my own point of view, which comes in the end, which, which actually is a conclusion of these five facts. So first of all, why is India not implementing the UN Security Council resolutions? So we talk about what the Security Council resolution said. Essentially, the foundational resolution had three points. Number one, Pakistan should withdraw all its forces from Kashmir, which they never did. Number two, India should thin out its troops, leaving out the minimum to maintain law and order. And third, India should then set up an all-party government in Kashmir, which will be like a plebiscite government, while the UN appoints a governor who comes or commissioner who comes and holds a plebiscite. So both India and Pakistan merrily violated this because Pakistan never withdrew its army. Step one wasn't taken. So India saw no particular need to take step two and three. So those resolutions were never followed by either side. First obligation was Pakistan's, not India's. Second, why are we then not settling it under Shimla agreement? So what is the Shimla Agreement? Once again, we say, read the Shimla Agreement. Shimla Agreement doesn't say Kashmir is a problem <clears throat> which has to be resolved in those terms. Shimla Agreement says all problems between India and Pakistan now are bilateral, which means no UN, re UN resolutions, no mediation. In the 60s, there was strong mediation by some foreign mediators, formally in the India-Pakistan talks. So no mediation. So the history that began in 1947 with the UN resolutions then ended in 1972. But Shimla agreement has also been violated. But unlike the UN resolutions, it's been violated only by one party, that is Pakistan. Because as soon as Bhutto signed the Shimla agreement, he went back and he started working on his nuclear weapon. In fact, he called it the Islamic bomb. Uh, he held the OIC summit in Lahore and announced the Islamic bomb there. And once the Pakistanis had the comfort of their nuclear weapon by 1989 and the confidence having defeated the Soviets in Afghanistan, that they were back at India's throats. Uh, once again, trying to take Kashmir by force in the middle in 1965, they had launched a full-fledged war starting in first week of August by sending a couple of tens of thousands, in fact, more infiltrators, which were basically Pakistani army soldiers uh, in civilian uniform, but carrying reg regular issue Pakistani weapons to try and take Kashmir and create an insurrection. That didn't happen. So first week, September, <coughs> Ayub Khan launched, Field Marshal Ayub Khan launched what was called as Operation Grand Slam. First was Operation Gibraltar to take Kashmir by brute military force, so tanks were sent in, and, uh, and it was a full-fledged attack. That failed also. 
So 47, 65, Pakistan failed to take it by force. So the third question, can India keep Kashmir by, through military power forever? To which I ask a counter, but can a country take Kashmir with military power, by using military power from India? Pakistanis have tried that and they have failed. So we go on uh, raising other similar questions. Now, uh, Pebisit. Okay, uh, you don't want Kashmiris to go to Pakistan. Let them be independent. Everybody wants Azadi. So we again say, read the text of the UN resolutions. The UN resolutions don't give the option of Azadi. They only give two options. Choose India or choose Pakistan. So Pakistan has played this great subterfuge and this Goebbelsian uh, campaign over these many years, calling the part of Kashmir it has occupied or it controls Azad Kashmir. That's a fallacy. There is no such definition, there is no such presumption, there is no such option that Kashmir will be Azad or independent of India or Pakistan. That is a lemon that the, that, that the Pakistanis have sold to some sections of the global commentariat and to some people in Kashmir. The option is just India and Pakistan. That's my brutal fact check. And finally, my reality check, which is my own analysis that you have to now accept the logic of Shimla, Shimla Agreement, which is that this line of control is the border between the two countries. Essentially, this border has now survived more than 70 years, barring minor changes here and there. Nobody can change it. We don't need Bill Clinton again to come to the subcontinent and tell us by wagging his finger that lines on the maps of the subcontinent can no longer be drawn in blood. It's never going to happen. This line is now the border. Once you accept that this line is the border, then you can address problems. There are problems in Kashmir, on our side of Kashmir. There, are, there is anger, there is alienation, there is violence, there is bloodshed, there is human rights violations, there are excesses, there is denial of freedoms, all that is there. But you can only address it once you accept that there will not be any change in the political, sovereign or territorial status of Kashmir.